Hello. Hey, you know in scripture where it says God inhabits the praise of his people? That's a house I want to be in all the time. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That's so good. So, hey, good morning. If you got here after the first time I was up here, my name's Justin. It's nice to see you. Um, and super excited just to, to dive in today. Um, if you're new, you haven't been here for a while, we're in week three of a series called Redefine, right? Where we are just looking at the church and how it is defined according to scripture and what it looks like. And so for these past few weeks, we have just taken one of our core values as a church and we've explored scripture and it's, it's kind of like the four pillars of how this house is built, right? As a network, we have a, a, a big idea, a belief, a mission, and that mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And so no matter where you are at on that spectrum, our hope, our goal, our prayer is to come alongside you and help you take that next right step, right? A growing relationship. And we're going to talk about this a little more next week, but we believe, right, unlimited spiritual growth happens when you pour into the lives of other people. And so it's really an honor and a privilege for us as the church to pour into one another because then that mission we're always pursuing. Does that make sense? And so that's what we love. And so these last few weeks, we've talked about core value after core value. We're going to continue that today. That's how we do this, right? One of the things. So if you weren't here the first week, we talked about connecting together, right? We grow as a family. We really want this to feel like a home. And we think we connect or we grow as a family when we connect together. And there's group signups and ways that we get together here on Sunday morning, but also outside of church. And then last week, we talked about everybody's favorite thing, money, right? We talked about generosity and we, we really broke down scripture of what's expected, right? What was asked and then how do we go above and beyond that? And, and as Rebecca said and shared that story, right? We believe that generosity is not just with one aspect of our life, but it's our whole life, our time, our talent, and our treasure. And so we dove into scripture on how Jesus took what was expected and he built and he grew and he expanded that to include this crazy generosity. And so today I want to pray and then I just want to dive right into the third thing. All right, so let's pray. God, I again just thank you for today. I thank you for just a chance to come and to cast out good, bad, everything indifferent in our lives, to come here solely to worship you, to thank you for who you are, for what you've done and what you continue to do in and through each of our lives, God. And so as we continue to worship you today through the study of your word, God, we invite your spirit to just enlighten our eyes, to enlighten our hearts, to quiet our minds of any thoughts, any distractions, any feelings that might be getting in the way of you so that we can come fully into your presence and experience the power of your spirit. And so God, I just pray that you would bring your word to life in our life. God, that you would just help us um, to take what it is that you've given us you know over these thousands of thousands of years and help it not just to stay with us but to move through us to the people in our lives where we live work learn and play and so thank you again for the opportunity to worship you thank you for the opportunity to study your word and we ask and we pray it in Jesus name amen so I'm gonna kick it right off the bat right our third value right one of the the, the third thing that we like to focus on is involve serving right and what we like to say is we find our purpose as we serve others. And so think about this. Have you, you don't have to raise your hands, but have you ever wondered like, ah, what's my purpose? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? If you've thought that, then I want you to lean in a little bit and, and start to sit with me to understand that when we serve God, by serving one another, we will step into and walk into our purpose, okay? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do me a favor. Everyone say, I will. Okay, you can't lie. Think back to a time when you first came to church. It can be this one or any others, okay? Thinking, you got it? Think through that experience. What was it like? Was it good? Was it bad? Was it overwhelming? 
Were you here trying to hide and a guy who looks just like me ruined your life when he walked in the door and he called you by name? <laughs> that was Rebecca's story. And Tony and their children. But think through that experience. What was it like? How many of you guys were nervous to come into a church for the first time? Who was excited? Who was a little bit of both? That's where I was, right? Kind of half in, half out, like get me close to this door so if I need to bolt because it's crazy, that's where we are. And so I want to tell you a little story about the first time we walked in here. And this is really funny because my wife's not here. Um, she's with my daughter and not feeling well. But when we came here the first time, Brittany had just had throat surgery and she couldn't speak. Like she was on vocal rest, which doesn't bother her because she's so introverted. Like she would prefer that be her whole life. Like she had a little notebook. Oh, hey, I can't talk. Nice to see you. She was in heaven. It was the greatest first experience for her ever. But when we came, we were, we were hurting, right? We were not in a good place. And to just be 100% honest, we wanted to hide. We wanted to come in that door. We wanted to sit near the back. We wanted to worship God because that was still very important to us. And we wanted to dip out. We wanted to leave. Now, the problem with that is we have two tiny humans with us. And just like most of you, we did not want those tiny humans in here. So we had to check them in to kids ministry. Well, guess what that involves? People. I love that. I like talking to everybody. I would have met everybody. But in that moment, the hurt and the pain was so real and still pretty fresh that it was raw that we were just leery of everything. So we checked our kids in. Boom. We talked to a couple people. We talked to the people at the cafe. And then we came into church. And what that got me thinking is many people all right, many people who come through these doors, but any doors just like them for the first time, they come in hurting, right? They've, they've been so many times that I have found out that people are like, oh yeah, I came to your church because I got a really bad diagnosis and I, yeah, I had to think through this or my relationships were really struggling when we walked through that door and or, hey, we were having one of the biggest financial struggles we had ever had. And here's what I know, we weren't any different. When we walked through that door, we were just like most other people. We were hurting, we were asking questions, and we had a pain that ran a little deep. And this church helped us to heal, right? It used to, if you've been here for a while, right when you walked in the door, it said, hope lives here. And I, I cannot say this for distinct memory because you guys have heard me confess this, but I'm pretty positive I went, Pfft. what a church answer, right? Like every church says that. But stick with me because we came here and this church helped us to heal, right? It gave us a place to connect. It gave us a place to love Jesus with other people. And most importantly for us in that moment, we were cared for. And here's what I want to tell you. That all happened because people were serving us, right? My experience had much less to do with me than it had to do with a group of people who loved God, who loved his word, and they did exactly what it said. And so one of our goals as a staff has been to do that same thing. I'm going to throw up a slide right here behind me. And this was kind of the process that we went through, right? We came here looking for help. That help turned into healing. That healing rebuilt our hope. And that hope turned into our home. Because when we came here, I wasn't on staff. I was just, just Justin, just Brittany, just Cooper, just Kenley. We had talked to a couple people that went here. True confession, my wife like Facebook saw Chris Miller and was like, he's a pastor, you should be friends with him. Our kids go to school together. That's how our relationship started. Then it gets even creepier. We went on a walk in the woods. Like, can you, that's a lifetime movie waiting to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's how our journey here started. And that help that we received the moment we walked through the door. It started in us this little bit of healing and that healing over time grew to hope and that hope continued to grow and that hope turned into a home. And this is one of the things that I love. If, if you pay attention to the words that we say, we will not ever call the people that serve here volunteers because we think they're so much more than people who volunteer, right? We call them difference makers. And that day when we came in, those people made a difference in our life. And so when we say, hey, do you wanna be a difference maker? It's not just a cute word for volunteer. It's 
We want to train you up, raise you up to release you to go make a difference in the world, both here and out there. Amen. And so here's what I love, right? Paul, he's writing a letter to the Galatians and he says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, right? Your sinful desires, what you want to do. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And so one of the things that I love about this is we're going to dive through so much scripture is that he says we are free in Jesus, right? He saved us from the bondage, the trap, the jail cell of sin. But then he's like, don't turn back, right? Don't turn back to the thing that trapped you, right? Sin gives you this idea, this thought, this lie that you're free, but it's really just a chain and it, it lets you go so far and then it pulls you back. And Paul's like, hey, hey, you are free but don't run back to the ways of this world. Instead, serve one another, right? And here's what I love. We love talking about serving. We think it's so true. It's who Jesus was. It's who we're called to be. But I need you to hear me. In a few weeks, it's probably like six, we're going to have an entire series about how to serve our community and how to be the visible light. And so today, I'm just going to talk about how we as the church can serve the church. You with me? You tracking with me? You should serve here and there and everywhere, but just for today, we're talking about the church. A few weeks, community. You with me? So I need you to hear that. I don't want to get an email. Pastor, now you heard me, okay? Now listen to what Paul says. Now I'm not super off with this. Listen to what Paul says. Paul, chapter later in Galatians chapter 6, he says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to who? All people especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Who's that? Us, the church, right? So that's Paul, right? The gathered church is unique in the sense that it's this dedicated place, right? We meet here, but this isn't the church. This is just where we hang out, right? You are the church. And so what Paul is saying is, hey, do good to all people, right? Do good, but you need to care for the believers. You need to care for the people of the church, right? And so while we come here to worship, to learn, and to pray, we also come here to serve others who are worshiping, learning, and praying, right? This is what I love. This is how scripture is awesome. So Paul wrote that. You flip over a few, few pages in your Bible. Peter writes a letter called First Peter. And in chapter 4, he says this, right? And this is a little context he says, hey, you've spent a long time living how the world lives, and now time is short, right? Things are, things are drawing to the end. You need to pay attention. This is what he says, verse 8, 9, and 10. Above all, right? Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Some of you need to underline without grumbling. Each of you... Each of you, all of us, should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So when you and I, when we serve one another, one, we're demonstrating the love that God demonstrated towards us through Jesus, right? But we're also extending grace. We're showing grace in all of its various kinds because you have been through something and you have been through something and you have been through something and it's all different, but when you and I serve one another, oh man, right? Well, well, I, how come, and this makes my brain think like this is just an aside, but you know the disciples, right? Not all of them were perfectly healthy men, these first original 12 followers. And a couple of them struggled lifelong. Paul struggled lifelong, whatever this thorn in his flesh is. And I, can you just picture Jesus saying, hey, I've healed so many people. And they will all sing my praise and testimony for that. But imagine what it's like when you, someone who is still struggling and will struggle till the day that you meet me and my father face to face in eternity, struggles their whole life and yet you still sing my praise. That's something we're thinking about, right? And so when he says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, some of us, we, we got to shift our perspective because some things we don't view as a gift, we view as a burden, but it's really a gift from God to glorify God. More on that in a little bit. All right, but this goes along with what Paul just said. And so 
here's a couple thoughts, and I'm going to jump into some scripture. But when you and I, right, when we come together and we serve this house, when we serve this place, it does a couple of different things. First one, I just told you about my story. It allows people to find healing, hope, and a home, right? It allows people to find healing, hope, and a home. Here's the reality, right? Many of you know this. It's not hard for you to slip in and slip out of here each week, true or false, right? If you want to hide, you can go to some churches and you can hide real quick, check off the God box, and then leave. And one of the reasons is the more and more of you that continue to live out the life that God has called you to do, we will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there is still only one of me or four or five or six of the staff people. And so it's going to get harder to know each and every one of you. Unless I'm like, hey, you in the back, don't leave. I need to say hello to you. Uh, hello, trauma, never coming back to church again in your life. You know what I'm saying? And so as we grow, the way that we see people, the way that we help people, the way that we help them know that God sees them is by serving, right? If you remember a few Weeks ago now, I, I did a whole bunch of things with Christmas lights, right? So you imagine that each one of us is a light. And the more of us that serve, the more of us that give of ourselves, that we're generous with our time and our talent and our treasure, the more of an impact that we can have. And that's the whole point of this story, right? And that's what we want to do. You think about our story. When I walked into this church, I did not just meet a bunch of random people. I met someone at the kids' check-in. I don't remember who that was. Maybe you do, but I do not. I met someone at the kids' ministry room when we walked our kids back to the back, right? There was someone sitting in those classrooms who greeted us, who made us feel safe leaving our kids so that we could come and worship, right? I met someone at the cafe, and I love that because somebody would say, well, those are just people who were scheduled to serve. They were. And they did it in love, to love. But then here's what's amazing. We met so many other people as we came into this place who weren't scheduled to serve. They just knew something that I hope that you will learn. And it's this. You and I are not consumers. We are contributors, right? You and I are not consumers. You can go spiritual if you want. We are not spiritual consumers, right? You come here, you sit, you take in the word, you digest it. But then what do we do with it, right? We are here to contribute. We're here to worship. We're here to love God. We're here to lead others to do the same. And so that's what this church taught me from day one, right? That's why I, that's one of the many reasons, let's be honest, many reasons that I love this place, right? We aren't consumers, we're contributors. You and I aren't called to come here and just consume and leave. This is old school, but someone taught me this. I don't remember where it was, but they said, you're saved to serve, right? You're saved to serve. Use that freedom for good. And that, that's kind of the hope, right? The more that you spend time here, right? The more that you spend time here surrounded by people, there's a few things I want you to hear. Serving isn't just something we do, right? It's an action that reflects the character of who we are. And here's the next one. I do want you to see this, right? Serving isn't just something we do. Servants is who we are are. Right at the end of our life, what is Jesus going to tell us? See you bye, I never knew you, or well done, good and faithful servant. Not teacher, not husband, not wife, none of those things. Well done, good and faithful servant. And here's what I love. This is the most beautiful picture. When we serve others, we are serving Christ, right? Listen to what Jesus says. This is him talking, red letters, right? Matthew 25, he's telling a story and he's talking about when he comes back and he's like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have some people. I'm gonna gather all these people around me. There are gonna be some sheep who are followers of Jesus. There's gonna be some goats, people who are not. And they're all gonna gather around me and he's gonna tell the sheep, hey, sorry. Or he's gonna tell the goats, whew, good save. He's gonna tell the goats, see ya, I never knew you. You got a whole place waiting for you. But then he looks at the sheep, this is what he says. The king will say to those on his right, that's important, we don't have time. We'll talk about it after service if you want. To those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, which is the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. 
For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Jesus said, oh no, I'm sorry, next verse. When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I haven't talked about Bob Goff in a long time. He's one of my favorite actors. He would tell you we were best friends. He wouldn't tell you that. I would tell you we're pretty close friends. But one of my things that I love about him is he takes these verses that we just read and he, he does them. You know what that looks like. He lives in California. He goes to the nude beach. He gets socks. He throws socks at the naked people on the beach. No lie. He's, that's his story. He teaches in prison. He's a lawyer. He's a professor. And he's like, you know who my favorite students are? The ones who are in San Quentin. Because they never graduate. I just get to keep talking to them over and over and over because they're all on death row. Right? They're all there. And so what would happen if we look at these verses, because Jesus is talking to sheep, he's talking to followers of Jesus, and he says, hey, when I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was a stranger, when I needed clothes, you did those things. And, and the righteous, right, the followers of Jesus said, uh, we, we didn't do that. We didn't see you, right? We, we, we didn't do that to you. How did we do that? And Jesus said, yeah, when you did those things to them, you were doing them to me, right? When we serve others, we are serving Jesus. And that's the beauty, right? Some of us, you work in kids ministry. And if you've ever worked in kids ministry, right? If one baby cries, what happens to the rest of the room? They all cry and you're like, I'm out of here. I'm done with this place. But what changes your whole perspective is I'm not welcoming a baby. I'm not welcoming a toddler. I'm not welcoming a kindergartner. And I'm welcoming Jesus into the room. And it's such a beautiful thing. Brett's daughter, Emma, came up to me this morning. She said, do you know what we did at my school? She said, somebody fell and got hurt on the playground. And so we just prayed for them. Where do you think she learned that? You guys and at home. Right, that's the amazing thing about serving one another. Serving isn't something we do. Servants are us, right? Servants are who we are. The second thing that serving teaches us is part of our value, right? Serving allows us to find our purpose, right? That's the goal. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Yes, you do. Worship God. Love God. Serve him by serving others. I don't know what that looks like. Well, great. We got a whole long time to talk through that, right? Every single one of us has different gifts. Every single one of us has gifts. And those gifts, those passions, those desires are intended to be used for God and by God, right? Those are the gifts. And so here's the question. Are we willing to do what may seem insignificant at the time, remembering that when we serve others, it's serving Jesus. And I'm talking the most insignificant. If I'm changing the diaper of a kid who will never remember me, if I'm weed eating the bank from Don, where's Don at? Yeah, Don and Cody know this hill over here. It's trimmed for your pleasure and our calf's joy, right? But those are the things that it, it's the mindset of, hey, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for God. And it, it just enlightens your whole perspective. And so you think through this. Maybe you love hospitality, right? You love hosting. You say, hey, you know what? I'm going to host a connect group. Or I love being around people. You're going to say, hey, I'll sit up in the cafe and set that area up. Maybe you like looking around and you're always hyper vigilant and alert. Hey, guess what? We got a security team. You can walk and look for an hour and a half every Sunday morning. You just walk and look. Keep people safe. Right? Maybe your way of building up the church is more of like a technology role. And, and guess what? I hung out with a bunch of people this morning. They would have loved some help this morning because it was crazy. But it worked. Right? And so there's so many different things. Maybe you're wired with, to connect with teenagers or you love playing with toddlers or you can play an instrument. Maybe you like to take pictures or videos. Right? God has uniquely designed you in a way that can build up the church making a difference because you're a difference maker in the life that God has given you. Jesus highlights this. Right? Matthew 20, 28. 
Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and then look at this, served in the greatest way, to give his life as a ransom for many. And so I started thinking about this, right? It's a story we've talked about, but one story highlights this truth more than any other, right? That Jesus, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve. And so him paint the picture, right? Jesus and his disciples are having a meeting. It's actually going to be the last one they have for a while. And so he's sitting down about to have dinner with his closest friends. And you know what these guys do? They start arguing. They start arguing about who is the greatest. Now, this is laughable to you and I because who's in the room? Jesus. Who's in the room? The greatest. And they're arguing, right? And so John's like, well, clearly I'm the favorite. I'm the one Jesus loves. Then Bartholomew speaks up and they're like, Bartholomew, get out of here. Nobody even knows you're on the Big 12. You're like, how many of you guys knew he was on the Big 12? Be honest in church. You know what I'm saying? Like, so this is the group. And so what does Jesus do? How does Jesus respond, right? There, and I, I want you, you guys know me, paint this picture. He's sitting on the eve of his death. And his closest followers, the people who are supposed to get him the most, are arguing about who is the greatest. Verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. What's that mean? He knew he was dying. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And I, and I don't know this scene, but I just picture them arguing he slowly stands up, a couple of them pay attention, and he bends down and he starts washing their feet. And you guys know that they didn't sit in chairs to eat dinner, right? They laid down. I've shown you this before. Like they reclined literally, so leaning on a shoulder so their feet were near the other person. And so Jesus kneels down and he just starts washing someone's feet. And then he dries and it's kind of like when the teacher's like, if you can hear me, clap once, right? And so as he starts this, a hush walks over the room. He gets to this Peter. Hey, Peter's like, you're never going to wash me. <laughs> oh, Peter. And Jesus says, has this conversation with him like, hey, if I don't do this, you're not fit. Right? And so they have this dialogue and then he continues to wash their feet. Right? And, and they object to this, rightfully so, because they know that the person who washes the feet is the, the servant of the house, the lowest servant in the house, not the king of the world. But here goes Jesus walking around, right? He finishes up. He washes their feet, right? He looks around. He sees their proud hearts. He puts on a servant's apron and he bends down. And look what he, he does, right? He had taught them earlier in their life that the greatest among you, right? The greatest among you is the one who serves. Look at how the story ends. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. Notice how he didn't let him answer because he knew they didn't have one. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am, right? Teacher, Lord. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, so let's break this down, right? Lord means leader. If he says go, guess what you do? Go. Teacher, what is he teaching us? Which way to go? Okay, so you track him with me? Now that I, your Lord, your leader, and your teacher have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. Some of you cringe, right? Does that mean we have to do that right now? Different custom. Don't panic, right? Some of you have lunch plans today. You do not have to wash their feet. But watch what he says in verse 15, 16, and 17. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Don't miss this verse. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Right? You will be blessed if you do them. Jesus just demonstrated our purpose. We are here to serve, right? Serving isn't just something we do. It reflects who we are. Serving isn't just something we do. Servants is who we are. And when we serve other people, we are serving Christ. Jesus sets this precedent that we are all called and created to serve. And here's why right? Somebody somewhere is waiting on you to do what God has called you to do. Somebody somewhere 
is waiting for each and every one of us to do what God has called us to do. We never know, right? You hear me say this all the time. You and I never know who or what is on the other side of our obedience. And that somebody is waiting for you to do what God has called you to do. And I want to show you something that gives me goosebumps. So now I'm not a liar. Every time we talk about it, put this picture up here. So this is a picture of a guy named Justin. Great name. And this is a picture of Hunter. And on Good Friday, we had an interactive service. And what happened, we invited families, people to come, and you just walk through this final week of Jesus' life. Well, Justin came in by himself, and me, Rachel, and Chris were talking, and it hit us. Oh, man, he's going through the foot washing station, and nobody is there to wash his feet. So we talked for a minute. I turned the corner to wash his feet. And Hunter, where's Brett Woodley? How old is Hunter? Is he in here? I don't remember. Sixth grade, right? Kid. And so Hunter is down on his hands and knees, never have met Justin. And he's not only washing his feet, but he is praying over him. If you've ever heard the song, The Blessing, it's scripture. And Hunter is praying this song over this man, Justin, whom he has never met. And washing his feet. And when I look at this picture, it reminds me why Jesus says, hey, you need to have faith like a child. Because that child could have made any excuse. If I said, hey, we're going to have a foot washing service, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to start. What are you doing during the prayer? You're bouncing out of here. Because some of you are so disgusted by the thought of feet. Some of you got the nastiest feet on the planet. Let's just call it what it is. None of that mattered to this little boy. None of it. And I'll tell you that after Justin finished that service, he came out and he hugged every single one of us. And he said, I will never forget today. I will never forget the love that was shown to me today. I don't, Justin didn't even know that kid's name. And, and Hunter did something that his Savior did thousands of years ago that he has called each and every one of us to do. Why? Because somebody somewhere is waiting on you to do what God has called you to do. And so here's what this looks like, right? As the band comes back up, there's three things that this looks like for us, right? How do we do this? We've talked all about being a servant. We've talked all about this. These, I'm just going to run through them real quick. Your attitude, your availability, and your action, right? Some of us I just don't really know. Serving's not really my thing. I don't really have any gifts, right? We got to renew our minds to have the same mindset of Jesus. Why? Because our attitude is going to develop and it's going to determine our availability when it comes to serving, right? Just like we talked about last week with generosity. God says, I want a cheerful giver. I don't want you to show up, right, without grumbling. Remember that? He says, I want you to cheerfully give of your time, your talent, and your treasure. So I need your attitude to be that, right? Scripture says in Philippians, Jesus left heaven, right? Considering, he knew what he had and he knew what he was leaving and where did he come? Here, willingly, not coerced, but willingly. So he had the right attitude, availability. We don't got time to talk about this all day, but some of y'all are way too busy. You need to change what you care about, right? Let me tell you a secret. When you get to heaven, whatever you are investing all your time in probably doesn't matter, right? Right? Let me tell you this, a full calendar doesn't equal a full life. Write that down. A full calendar doesn't always equal a full life. Are you available to serve others? If the answer is no, quit something. Do you have margin in your life to serve others? No, quit something. Do you have time in your life to serve other people? Nope. Quit something, right? If you can't quit it, you help me, you call me, I'll help you. I'm great at quitting stuff for other people. Now hear me when I say this. Are there busy seasons in life? Yes, right? If you've been busy for 17 years, you're doing life wrong, right? Busy is not a badge of honor. But that's what we say. That's the easiest answer. How's life been, pastor? Busy. Who made it busy? I can say no just as easy as I can say yes. 
So we got to have the right attitude. We got to be available. And the last thing is action. And this is my favorite. Will you act as if though you believe in Jesus? And that's true, right? Jesus didn't say, believe in me and change the world. He said, when you follow me, it can change the world. You and I can't make God move, but we can make room for God to move. Amen. Imagine, right? Imagine if no one fell through the cracks because every person in this place knew they were made for more than consuming, right? They were made to contribute. You and I can't make God move, but we can make room for him. Amen.